And now on Chatterbox, we're lucky enough to have Chris Spedding with us. Chris, hello and welcome to Chatterbox. How hello, are you? Chris. Uh, I'm very good, thank you. Good, good. Down here. Oh, yes. On the south coast. We're on the south coast as well. We're a little bit further along from you. We're, we're based in Hastings. So, uh, but, right. but like you, I'm sure you work from home now, so do we these days, so that's, that's what we all do. Now, Chris, very, very interesting career, well over 50 years, uh, absolutely incredible. And we will obviously talk a little bit about your uh, little novelty single you had, but your career it is absolutely incredible. I'm looking at these collaborations here. Just start at the beginning. Did, did you learn to play an instrument, a guitar, whatever, as a kid, or how did it all start? Um, well, I actually started as a kid when I was about nine mm. uh, on the violin. Well, okay. So my mum and dad were both uh, sort of musicians. My dad used to play the piano, mm -hmm. and my mother used to sing. She sung in one of those bark choirs. She used to do all those classical things. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and the 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 house was a bit um, a bit straight. It was all like classical music and stuff. Uh, we, they didn't even like the dance band stuff, you know, the Glenn Miller oh. stuff, the Frank Sinatra, <laughs> okay. they didn't even go for that. So I was uh, totally uh, un unprepared for when rock and roll started to happen. And I was very unimpressed with the fact that I got a violin and I wanted to get a guitar, you know, when rock and yeah. roll started around, for us it was around 1956, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd have been 12 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's when I started uh, wanting to have a guitar. Okay, so what age were you when you actually bought a guitar and brought one into the house? Uh, well, it was about that, you know, like, uh, I say I had a mandolin, which is like a bit of a halfway between a guitar and a violin, because it's tuned like a violin, about the size of a violin. Yes. But of course, it didn't sound anything like a guitar. Um, <laughs> so a mandolin I had. So uh, and, um, yeah, we couldn't really, you know, uh, I, I had sort of various cheap sort of hand-me-down time guitars at the mm -hmm. beginning. Um, and then I sort of tried to insist on having a, a, a decent guitar and, and, and they, they wanted to send me to lessons because they thought, um, if you're going to play this horrible music, you might as well play it properly. Because I didn't oh. approve of, mm -hmm. not, not many adults, parents did in, in the 50s. I see. It was considered like worse than we consider hip-hop and rap today, you know, like bad boy yeah. music. Um, I, I it, sound... was, it wasn't until the Beatles came along. Which okay. A lot of people forget this, you know, that, that pop music or anything like with a beat was considered uh, even healthy for people to listen to. <laughs> it was considered, uh, <laughs> okay. as I said, bad boy musicals. Uh, teddy boys were uh, uh, associated with it, you know, like bikers and murder wells. Uh, so it was a, a bit of a rebellious thing, you know, it went well with the sort of teenage thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so uh, I eventually got uh, a decent electric guitar. Cool. And then, of course, I, I was started, started to ask for an amplifier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no good having an electric guitar if you don't have an amplifier. Well, I agree with that. Was this at home as well? That was, I was still at home. Wow. 13, 14. How did your old. parents take to that? Sorry? How did your parents take to that then? Um, well, of course, they um, they knew that they didn't like the horrible noise that uh, <laughs> rock and roll music played. So that, uh, the idea of having it even louder than I was playing it on this acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. I had an acoustic guitar with a pickup on it, so it was kind of semi-electric. Sure. And the, the, the famous uh, uh, one-liner that I remember coming away from my mother, well, Segovia doesn't need an amplifier. <laughs> that was the... That was, <laughs> I was left with, you know, the sort of attitude that I was dealing with, which just made me even more rebellious. Eventually, I got one, a very quiet one, <laughs> from the school group, um, a band. Um, yeah, so that uh, when they sent me to the teacher, he, he, he um, was kind of a, an old, old school guy who weaned me onto listening to jazz. Mm -hmm. you know, well, this is the sort of music I'm familiar with, so you better learn this stuff. So mm -hmm. that's where my, the jazz side of things came from. Sure, so you sure. Be listening to jazz guitar players like uh, Charlie Christian and Barney Kessel. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I went through a very snobbish period where I thought that this was the way to go and that uh, guys like The Shadows or Hank Marvin were not really hip anymore. <laughs> okay. So I went through all 
that, you know. Uh, so that's really how I started. Great. So we, I think you're taking, well, you're taking us past the Beatles. You, you're taking us, it's probably, I've got to guess, somewhere in the mid-60s. Um, now, I believe you became a, a session musician before you had a, a solo success, I think. Um, so you were, were you a, a session musician at the end of the 60s? And, and yeah, how... about the end of the 60s. Was when my first big session was like uh, Jack Bruce mm-hmm. when Jack Bruce left Cream. He mm-hmm. looked for a guitar player and I guess... Uh, he didn't want anybody to, that, 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 that sounded like Eric Clapton because he'd had the genuine article. In of course. Cream. So uh, I guess I always think, well, why did he choose me? Mm-hmm. And I, I was probably one of the few guitar players playing around uh, in London in the late 60s that mm-hmm. didn't sound like Eric Clapton. Oh, um, very good. Very because good. of, uh, well, probably because of the snobbish thing, you know, mm-hmm. I haven't sounded like that, so I won't, I'll be different. Uh, which is a kind of a negative way, really, because the way the guitar was going was in that, that, that direction. So I'm not particularly proud of that bit of uh, stubborn sort of individualism. Mm-hmm. But it did get me that job. Well, well it worked. It worked. Um, oh, that yeah. was really the first of the people started to notice me. I got like the, the credit on the record, and I started doing sessions around 1968, 69. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I, I can see here um, that all music has described you as one of the UK's most versatile session guitarists. Uh, you've had a long career on two continents uh, that saw him tackle nearly every style of rock and roll, as well as sporadically attempting a solo career. Well, the, the bit at the end's a bit harsh, but it, it started off as a really nice bit, I think, that. Okay, yes. That's all music, that's right. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all, I just thought, oh, that looks good. And then, yeah, I believe should have left the last bit off. Uh, ever, well, that's their opinion. Um, OK, so we get ourselves into the 70s. Um, and I see you br- uh, brought out a solo album quite early into the, the 70s. Yeah, I think I did. We actually recorded that first album in 1969 mm-hmm. at Abbey Road. Oh, wow. um, okay. It was done around the same time that George Harrison was doing All Things Must Pass mm-hmm. uh, at the same studio. And I think we got squeezed in for a few days uh, when George was having a few days off. And all yeah. his equipment was all set up in the studio. <laughs> uh, it was number three studio in Abbey Road. Mm-hmm. Uh, strict instructions not to use any of it, but of course we did. Yeah. Um, I was kind of into, at the time, I was into Dylan and the basement tapes and the band and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that album is uh, quite derivative of that. But, uh, yeah. uh, you know, there was some quite original stuff on it, but I had the sort of lineup of the band with mm-hmm. the piano and the organ and the guitar mm-hmm. and bass and drums, you know. Okay. I'm, I'm looking here. I mean, I am obviously wikipedia it, so uh, anything I say wrong, please correct me. I won't find it. <laughs> we want to get it all right. But um, I'm quite impressed with this one. Uh, uh, se- session musician session musician with uh, Harry Nilsson's Breakthrough album. Yeah, the, the one that's called uh, Nilsson Schmilson, that's me. Okay, that well, he, that's a pretty, pretty big, pretty big uh, songwriter and singer there. I mean, he, he cut his teeth in a 67 time, writing a song for the monkeys of all people, but yeah, they hit it big by the time, yeah, you were there. Uh, played on the original recording of Jesus Christ Superstar. Yes, we did that. Well, I was in a band called Nucleus, and we were hired mm-hmm. as a rhythm section to do some of that stuff, along with the Grease Band who was uh, on, uh, on it as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that, that, that's, that's all pretty good. I'm looking at... Uh, this whole list of names, what happened, what sort of basically happened next? We've got this sort of early 70s to 1975 with, we say, motorbiking. I've got this long list of names. I mean, did were you already known by all these musicians or did did uh, a- a- Andy X Cream say to Paul McCartney, oh, you should have Chris, he's really good, blah, blah, blah. Was it, how did it work? Um, well, in the beginning of the 70s, I think I just got lumped in with all the other guitar players, you know. Like, mm-hmm. You want a guitar player on your record, he's good, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I did uh, all sorts of things. I would do uh, jingles for... Um, Jeff Wayne used to do these jingles. Sure. Writer. 
later became a big composer and producer. <laughs> yes, and, uh, yes. I used to do his stuff. Um, and then I joined the Sharks for two years, from mm -hmm. 72 to 74, uh, with Andy Fraser. Mm -hmm. um, and that was not a success, so we didn't get a big hit. We got the, the musical prep writers, who used to write about us. Mm -hmm. uh, but I gave up doing sessions for those two years, because I thought, sure, if yeah. it doesn't work, everybody's going to look at me, point the finger at me, because, oh yeah, he was like distracted by all the session work, you know, and didn't put his whole heart and soul into it, so I thought, I'm not going to uh, make that mistake. So yeah, I, I do. Two I, years I've yeah. been doing the session. Came back in 74, and that's when I sort of started being a little less, a little more picky with, this, with the studio work, and mm -hmm. I uh, charged a special fee. You know, okay, like, okay, yeah. scale or something, uh, which nobody in the, in the UK was doing at that time. Mm -hmm. But I figured, um, I'm, I'm not going to, get so much work if I charge a special fee mm -hmm. but the work that I do do I'll be I, I won't be doing like three sessions a day seven days a week mm -hmm. I'll be totally burnt out at least somebody that will hire me for uh, uh, if, if I charge an extra fee well somebody who really wants me mm -hmm. knows what my style is and really wants that so it's prepared to pay the extra and I'll probably work half the amount mm -hmm. of sessions but be more sort of uh not, not burnt out, you know, and sort of uh, happy to come along and do do the full whack, as it were. So that mm. kind of worked out for a while. Sure. Uh, around 1974. Okay. At 1974, I mean, I assume, maybe I'm wrong to assume, but 1974, and <laughs> I look at this with complete and utter fondness, uh, Mike Matt, The Wombles, that all came in at about 74. Were you... I mean, the most successful chart act in the UK in 1974, five top 20 hits on it, the Wombles had. Were you there when they were doing all, all that big stuff? And, and were you there when you know, Brighton for the Eurovision? Uh, yeah. Ah, I, wow. I did a session for Mike Bat with the Wombles before oh. I joined the Sharks. Okay. So that would have been like 72. Okay. Um, and then it's probably a little while before it became a big hit. Mm-hmm. Yep. And he was calling me up saying, you've got to come and play the follow-up because it's been such a big hit. And you were like, the reason that we, one of the reasons that it, it became big was, you know, your contribution mm. trying to butter me up, you know, to try and get me to <laughs> buy. I waited until the shots had broken up before I did more with the Wombles. Yeah. But yeah. I think I'm on pretty much every um, track of the Wombles, maybe a couple I missed out on. <laughs> and that was very big, yeah. I was yeah. doing a lot of, I was doing records with David Essex and mm -hmm. like that and, uh, so I was on a lot of hit records around that time. Well, absolutely, absolutely. Now we, you mentioned uh, 1974, five time. Obviously, we have that wonderful, wonderful little little single, um, which everyone knows, "Motorbiking." Did, did you write that one yourself? Uh, yes. And wow. uh, was was it meant to be a sort of a bit of a novelty single? Was were you a biker and meant it to be serious? Uh, you know, at the time. I'm sorry, what was that again? I was saying, we, we, did you mean it to be a novelty song or was it sort of like more serious? Were you actually a biker and that's how it came um, about? Well, I, I, was, I was quite into, uh, fascinated by the sort of pop music thing, you know, a bit mm. like Phil Spector was, you know, like, um, the, using the three-minute pop single as, a, as, a, as an art project, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, which is why I think what I think Phil Spector was thinking. And I, I yeah. was quite kind of, Having been on all these hits with Mike Bat and mm, David Essex mm. and uh, all these people, uh, I was quite intrigued by what made a young person, a young teeny bopper, buy, buy these records with their hard-earned pocket money, you know. And mm -hmm, yeah. What was it that, that sparked all this? And I tried to write one. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was it? And it did I, uh, yeah, I rather at, well? I sort of quite consciously looked at the chart and thought, well, you know, there's, there's all this, this all, this all sounds a bit the same, you know, the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, what, can I write something a bit different and, and get noticed because it's a bit different? And um, at the time, you know, anybody that appeared on top of the pops, you know, they'd have the, the blow dried hair and mm -hmm. the sort of flared mm -hmm. pants and the platform shoes and a bit of a glitter going on. So I thought, I'm going to go totally opposite and hark back to my original days in the 1950s when I would listen to Gene Vincent and. Eddie Cochran and Elvis 
and I'll write something more, a bit more rock and roll classic. Well, it, it has so a... the idea about writing about motorbikes came came along. Sure, no, great story. And, uh, that that sort of uh, idea worked for me that once. I've tried to do it since, but that idea seemed to work. But plus, I I, I took it to the right guy. I yes, it to yeah. Mickey Most, who was uh, at that time getting loads of hits with Susie Quattro and. Mm. Uh, um, uh, hot chocolate and yeah. all those uh, mud, all those people on uh, Rack Records, his uh, label. And of course, the record label that it came out on is also one that was a uh, pretty much uh, in the you know just in my opinion was the type of stuff I was listening to and buying. That really was the main main label in that era for the stuff I was listening to. Yeah, it was uh, good for uh, hit singles. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I went. I'd, I'd already I already knew Mickey Mouse. Sure, uh, because I'd worked. Um, on an album that he was producing with Donovan <laughs> before I went into the Sharks. Um, mm. So I knew who to go to because I tried making my own records before, like the one we discussed before, yeah. and thinking, that, oh, well, I can write a good tune, I can write a good pop song, uh, but I don't quite have the knowledge to make it a hit. I need a good producer. Mm -hmm. And as a session man, you can see what producers can do. Because mm -hmm. you're basically are working for the producer when you work as a session man. So I, I knew that he was hot. I went to him and he said, "Okay, that's going to be a hit, son." You know, like in the mm. movies almost. You know. mm. I think he even had his feet up on the desk and was smoking a cigar when he said that. So yeah. that was like <laughs> out of the movie. And um, of course, he was he was right. He got me out of my old record deal with Island Records, which I was in at the time. Mm -hmm. He just immediately got on the phone and called up the boss of Island Music. Island Records, uh, Chris Blackwell, mm -hmm. was able to do to do all that stuff. And I think before, before I left his office, after I'd been played in motorbiking, mm -hmm. he uh, he'd bought the studio. Wow. And I think we were in the studio by the end of the week. Wow, brilliant! So, uh, that was one of those show business stories, which is. Very good. But I think I ought to, uh, for anyone that's sort of... I, mean, I was a kid growing up in the 70s. Obviously, I remember the song, I remember Mickey Most. But I ought to explain to uh, anyone of a younger generation that... I mean, I don't watch X Factor or any of those, but uh, Mickey Most was a real leading guy, a bit like... What's his name? The one on X Factor. Uh, gone. Oh, yeah, Simon, Simon, Simon Cowell. Cowell, yeah. He's like a, 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 a 1970s version of Simon Cowell and uh, was basically New Faces was the one he was on, wasn't he? As was one of the, uh, uh, well, I don't know, judges or what they were. And uh, yeah, very big man he was. So yeah, the, the Simon Cowell of the 70s, in my opinion. So yeah, literally. Yeah. Now, now <laughs> absolutely brilliant. And this is why I asked you, it's, it's just this endless list. One solo single, fine. But all of these is, now look, we have um, also gone on tour as well. Um, I'm trying not to get it mixed up. Uh, we've got a list of sort of Brian Ferry, Roxy Music, Elton John, Brian Eno, Art Garfunkel. Uh, right. Typically tropical, that was a couple of engineers, that's fun that is, a couple of uh, studio engineers, wasn't it that? Ginger Baker. Um, and yeah, brilliant. Uh, so, you, you know, in my opinion, you, you're at the height, not not just a, a one-hit wonder. Actually, fantastic. Is there, is there any big ones I've missed? Oh, yeah. Um, well, John Cale, mm -hmm. playing the Velvet Underground. He oh, yes. One, one, one guy that I toured with mm -hmm. in 1974. And then during 1975, Roy Harper. Mm -hmm. I did an album with him and we did a tour. Mm -hmm. Um and all this was when I was having my own hit record. Uh, I would be on top of the pops, and then uh, I'd go along and play in a, in a club with John Cale. Wow. And one of the remarkable things about that time, which you don't get now, I don't think so much, mm -hmm. is uh, all the people that came to see John Cale wouldn't have been the slightest bit interested in some guy that's got a hit record like motorbiking and has been on top of the pops. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do this sort of double, have this sort of double life. Wow. By going along to a John Cale and playing the guitar in the background and being pretty much anonymous, mm -hmm. and being on, uh, having just been on top of the pops, <laughs> so no. um, absolutely brilliant. And uh, actually, it's something that doesn't happen. You know, the sort of division between pop music, top mm. forty pop music, and so-called serious music by sure. an ex-Velvet Underground member. N n never the twain shall meet. Basically, you know, was, I, I experienced that. It's quite interesting because I was I was playing for both camps, yeah. really. And of course, you were. I didn't make the distinction, but the the fans certainly did. 
Yeah, well, okay. it seemed to work for you, certainly. Uh, I see you made an appearance, so you're a bit of a bit of acting here, maybe. Uh, Paul McCartney's Give My Regards to Broad Street. You, you were actually in the film. I was looking ahead to the 80s. Mm. That's looking ahead to, and when I, by that time, I was living in New York. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think Brian, um, Paul had seen me playing with uh, Brian Ferry. I think he came mm. to the Albert Hall, where we were doing a... I did a Brian Ferry tour in 1977. Okay. I think he saw me there mm -hmm. and hired me to do his movie um, in uh, the Broad Street movie in, uh, I think, seven, 86, 87, something mm -hmm. like that. Yes, I, I remember it, yeah, it came around with that fog chorus as a little tidy support card. <laughs> I remember it now. Bit of a film fan, you see. Um, Joan, Ar Joan Armour Trading album, Me, Myself, I. Right, yeah, Pr perfect. in New York. That's some real classics. So New York, you sort of like had a... Uh, I see, is, is in the 80s, yeah, I've got you. Uh, Jerry Harrison of Talking Heads, working with yes, him. that's right, There's he, that, the Talking Heads broke up and uh, all mm -hmm. the various members did their thing. Mm -hmm. France and uh, Tina Weymouth did the Tom Tom Club. Mm -hmm. uh, David Byrne went off on his own. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jerry did his own thing called the Casual Gods. Got you, yeah. Um, and he hired me to do the tour. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I... I think I played some um, some in, something in the studio with him. But, uh, yeah, that was another world tour that I did. I went to Australia, New Zealand toward uh, England and the States. So, yeah, that was, that was a good period. I, I understand Rev It Up uh, was a song that you, you played on and apparently uh, got to number seven in the Billboard Hot 100. So, well done you. <laughs> you go. Oh, is that for Jerry Harris? Apparently so, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I got uh, it. Rev It Up, <laughs> Rev It Up it was called. Yeah, number seven on the Billboard Hot 100. 1988, okay. you go. So, well done. Um, OK, we're moving late 80s into the 90s. Um, what basically happens happens next for you? Nineties, I'm moving to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, let's see, what was I doing? I, I, well, we missed out Robert Gordon. I was doing quite mm -hmm. a bit with Robert Gordon, the rock and really guy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what got, got me to New York. Okay. I uh, did a couple of albums with him, did mm -hmm. a tour with him. Uh, and then I decided to go to New York, to, to uh, uh, California. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened there? Well, you know, we did a few, uh, did a few things. It wasn't that um, successful. I mean, in, you, in California, you you can uh, live on very little. So I, okay. I didn't. You don't need to be. Uh, I was able to buide my time and wait for the work to come in. Okay. Well, wonderful. Now, Jeff Wayne, another big name you've mentioned, but I see even since Millennium, you've done quite a bit of a quite a bit of work with Jeff Wayne. Uh, yeah, uh, well, in the seventies, nineteen seventy-seven, one of the last things I did before I went to New York, mm -hmm. we did War of the Worlds. Yeah, and um, of course, I let, then I left mm -hmm. England and lived in New York, and I had no idea that War of the Worlds was such a huge uh, success in uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I came back to live in the UK around the, uh, 2006, uh -huh. he'd started uh, touring with the yeah. uh, War of the Worlds. And so I'd done all those tours uh, since, I think, 2004 mm. with the War of the Worlds and Jeff Wayne. I see this interesting thing here that um, uh, there was also, this has passed me by, unfortunately, but uh, I'm very surprised it has, but I see there was also uh, a Jeff, uh, Jeff Wayne did a uh, War of the Worlds, The Next Generation, and, uh, between oh, 2012 yeah. and 14. Yeah, I mean, it's not like a band, like, mm. if it had been a band, you know, like the Beatles or something, like, or Paul yeah. McCartney, you, you, would, you would bring out an album and it would be all new stuff and you'd be yeah. all the new yeah. stuff and you'd get a new hit. But the War of the Worlds was just just the War of the Worlds. It was a double album, mm, mm. and they had a few hits from it. Yeah, was it um, Forever Autumn was a big hit for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't do, like do new songs because it wouldn't be War of the Worlds anymore. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, I can see that. I can, I can see. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, I mean, I think the, the 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 new version has got instead of Richard Burton doing the commentary, we got. Um, Liam Neeson. Mm -hmm. Liam Neeson. Uh, oh yes, yes, Liam yes, Neeson. yes, yes. Yeah. So of course Richard Burton had passed away mm -hmm. and couldn't do. We we used Richard Burton's voice on the first tour. Oh 
Oh, wonderful. Um, and then we used Liam Neeson's voice. So the guy wasn't there on stage. He, he, his voice was recorded. Mm-hmm. And we played live to his voice. I like that. I really like that conception. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Tasteful as well. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, cool. Uh, the technology wasn't around to have done World of the World's Tour in the 70s, but mm-hmm. it, it was, you know, because we had all got headphones on. I don't have an amplifier because it would have been too loud against the string section. Okay. So, yeah, so okay. all those things that we had to sort of technologically sort of sorted all those problems. Um, and we we're, were basically playing the whole album to a click track. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although we've got real live drums. The drummer's listening mm-hmm. to the click track. Um, <laughs> stuff like that. Sure. And he's, uh, he's got like rubber cymbals that don't splash over to the... Uh, to the uh, string section. I understand. And uh, all stuff like that. Brilliant. Uh, Absolutely. Br- sounds brilliant. Sounds amazing. Because we've got to yeah. be uh, split second timing because we've got to be in time with the pre recorded voice of Liam Neeson. Mm. No, no, absolutely. And, and the live uh, singers some, sometimes have to interact mm. with, with uh, backwards and forwards from Liam Neeson and the actor. So, of course, it can't be, uh, you can't be like a second behind mm. for the in time. So all that technology uh, came in in the, uh, I guess you, I guess you basically say came in in the 21st century. Mm, so mm. well up to date with all the technical stuff. Well, I see that the, the, the last decade that we've been through, you know, look at the last 10 years, well, we'll even look at the last seven years, actually, you've been uh, as active as ever. I see that you've uh, uh, special, you, you appeared at uh, Glastonbury 2014 as a oh, special yeah. guest for playing with Brian Ferry. Oh, with Glastonbury and with Brian Ferry. Yes, I did. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good, mate. Really. The Wombles, because I did the Wombles with Glastonbury as well. Wow, even better. <laughs> when I, in the suit, I appeared as me. <laughs> oh, I wish you dressed as a suit. Very <laughs> all dressed up. Yeah. Brilliant, Sue. Uh, yes, Sue's got a question for you, Chris. Chris, is there any group or band you would like to go on tour with? Hmm. Um, any bands I'd like to be on tour with? No. I think he's done them all. <laughs> um, well, as long as I'm playing, I don't mind. Mm-hmm. I'll come and play with anybody who wants me to come and play with them. Uh, cool. I don't really listen to a lot of bands these days. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a few records that I like. Uh, some, uh, by accident, I'll hear something. Oh, that's good. Who's that? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's not that I don't listen to anything. Sure. I. Um, I don't really follow anybody or buy their records anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I like the old records from the seventies, like the the uh, old what we used to call R and B. Got people like Al Green or Otis sure. Redding mm-hmm. or um, Motown, all that stuff. I'm a bit of an old an old fogey as far as that's <laughs> concerned. Um, and when you see the um, when you see the the shows like The Voice or mm-hmm. Britain's Got Talent and all that stuff, it, surprisingly a number of songs. That those artists will cover that are from that era. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the odd thing is that they they don't think, oh yeah, that's a Marvin Gaye song. Oh, that's an old song from uh, from Elvis Redding. Or they, they don't. They just think it's a new song. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know the yeah. original, which is sometimes uh, I guess it's I guess it's understandable. You know, young kids haven't been around. Mm. You know. Mm. But um, I see that. it's still viable music, and people are still having success with that sort of style of music today so uh, sure. you know, I, I still like the new, a lot of the new stuff I, I still quite like some of the uh, the, the um, hip hop stuff mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the uh, rap stuff which is Brilliant. great place Chris, some of those songs are really good tell me something I remember for during the punk era I was yeah. the guy that liked the disco I was saying, well, yeah, but not all of it. it okay. you know, some of the stuff, you know, you still hear Donna Summer stuff, Gloria mm-hmm. Gaynor, and uh, Chic, and all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah those, the, the, those records played on the radio, and it's still yeah. good stuff. I, I, I was going to ask you a, a, a punk question, if that's OK. Um, right. Is there any truth? Now, I've known this for very, I've known the rumour for a very long time. Um, is there any truth in the fact that uh, you played uh, bass guitar on Nevermind the Bollocks as the Sex Pistols? That's a new one. Oh, OK. <laughs> Did I play the guitar? Mm. Uh, well, no, I didn't. OK. Steve Jones played the guitar and the bass. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve Jones played the guitar and the bass. 
on in the Sex Pistols and uh, mm-hmm. was good guitar player. I, yeah, my yeah. involvement with, with them was that I helped them with their first demos. I produced their first demos, took them around to a few people, and I think I was instrumental in getting them their deal with EMI. Um, so that was the beginning and end of my uh, involvement okay. with them. And of course, because I was got quite a high profile as a guitar player, yeah, but yeah. Assumed, Okay, okay, yeah. And they thought, oh, well, they obviously can't play. They got to hire Chris Bedding to play. Right, so yeah. I, I understand. managed to introduce them to Chris Thomas, who mm-hmm. was eventually to produce them. And I had also already worked with Chris Thomas. Um, he produced one of my albums. Uh, Frankie Miller was another uh, guy. Mm-hmm. Chris Thomas went on to produce the Pretenders, who I'd been involved with. And um, they automatically assumed that Chris Thomas had got me into playing on the guitars, which mm-hmm. is not true. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, Chris, right. Um, assuming lockdown, we don't have a. It, listen, even we have a second lockdown or whatever. Where would Chris Bedding like to be in a year's time, career-wise? Oh, well, uh, back on the road. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Brian Ferry will be doing some shows. I'm sure it's sure. easy to get back on the road. We had last year postponed. Yes. Um, this year has been postponed, I believe. Yes, yeah, so far. It looks, oh, for, so for his uh, tour, yeah. 2022, yeah. we'll be back on the road. Brilliant. And that'll be a good thing for everybody, I think. Everybody will be most relieved. It, um, it will be. Meanwhile, I'll just uh, I occasionally do things at home. Sure. Uh, a little recording studio at home. Mm-hmm. Some people have asked me to do a guitar part for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, uh, Saturday night, I was playing live with a band. Um, in a place uh, locally here called the Rope Tackle, which is in Shoreham on Sea, mm-hmm. Shoreham by Sea, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a little venue, but there was no audience. There was about three cameramen and a sound man, and we were on the stage, sort of about five of us, all socially distanced. <laughs> yeah. And uh, people bought tickets and saw us online. So I don't know if we're going to the future, whether we're all going to have to do that in the future or in the next year in, at least. Mm. But that was the first time I played live mm. with other musicians, live musicians, uh, for over a year. Well, OK. Um, OK, Chris, it's a fantastic, fantastic career and fantastic life you've had. Um, before we part company, Chris... Um, oh, Sue, do you have anything else? I'm just wondering if it's, Chris, if you would do an autobiography, if that's oh, yeah. what the word I thought of. Ask him again. Well, I did that in about 2005. There was a, 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 a writer called Kim Bright mm-hmm. wrote a book, uh, a biography, not an autobiography. Mm-hmm. It was in her voice. You wrote about me. Yes, yes. It's called Chris Bedding, The Reluctant Guitar Hero. Mm. You can buy that as an e-book. Brilliant. Um, so Amazon or a usual, usual place? Somebody has asked me to do uh, an autobiography, mm-hmm. uh, which we're think, still thinking about. We don't know whether we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of been in the works. I wasn't that keen on doing the autobiography because I, I work quite closely with Kim Bright on the on the biography. Yeah. She just asked me questions on the email, and I'd email her back with all the answers. Mm-hmm. So all my best stories, some of which I've, I've, told, I've shared with you, <laughs> I've already been told on, in this book, so what more can I write in an autobiography unless I start making stuff up? <laughs> uh, you have played with it. I mean, the, the amount that you, you've squeezed in since the late 60s till today is uh, pretty amazing. You know, the, there, is, there is definitely a book there. Definitely a book just there. Uh, Seriously. Yeah, well, the the, the um, Kim Bryant book is pretty uh, uh-huh. comprehensive. It's, it's cool. quite a lot of stuff. She's covered it all. Okay. Um, rather too much as I, but I, you know, I <laughs> okay. too much information. <laughs> oh, right. uh, Chris, right, this is your moment. Um, I, website, Facebook pages, Facebook groups. How can people find you? 
I'm sorry, what was that again? Uh, any, any websites, Facebook pages, Facebook groups, any, any YouTube channels? Uh, what do you have where people can sort of look and find you? Oh, there's a website. Mm-hmm. Um, it's com. That works, because I've got a hold of you that way, yeah. And I've got... Uh, you've got to get the right Facebook thing, because one of them is uh, some guy who's not me. Oh, OK. There's more than one. OK. Um, and I, in the days when there was MySpace, mm-hmm. you remember MySpace? I don't yeah. know have it anymore. People were writing to that, thinking they were writing to me. Mm-hmm. People that I knew. And then I get an email from somebody saying, well, why don't you reply to mine? So I said, well, that's not me. I, I don't look at that. Mm-hmm. And so I, I thought, well, what can I do about shutting it down? So I, I, I logged on to it, this MySpace thing, and I thought, hey, this is quite good. They've got all this stuff about me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. And I thought, I didn't have the heart to shut them down. Oh, um, okay. But you've got to get the right one. The, 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 uh, it's, uh, the Facebook thing is me. Mm-hmm. Facebook, Chris Penny. But there is another one. Okay. Another Facebook one. Okay, I, I sent um, a I sent a friend request to one earlier that's got five hundred twenty five uh, friends, so that may be you. Or it may not be you. <laughs> so, okay. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I've never been asked this question. How do you? Uh, okay. How do you def- uh, um, identify the right one? <laughs> so I I only go to this particular one, and uh, sometimes if uh, somebody writes to me and wants to be my friend, I just look at to see what friends they've got. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Of course. No, half a dozen of them. I think, mm. Okay, you can be my friend mm. too, since you know lots of my friends. But yep. usually, if I, I think it most people do that. No, we can edit that down I, anyway. But the and I don't really think I don't see any familiar names amongst their friends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then I'll just sort of say, well, you know, I'll ignore that. No, that's cool. So I think most important, Chris Bedding, all one word dot com. Yeah. yeah, brilliant, and a great, great website you got there as well, Chris. And that's obviously how I got hold of you. So that that is well worth a look. Yeah, you said you wrote to the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, an amazing career, and I know that there's a lot of lot of life left in you yet. Uh, just it, it means a lot, and uh, thank you for coming on Chatterbox. Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Cheers, cheers, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, bye bye. Bye bye.